All right, and I think we're off and running. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to, let's see, here we are, Researching Your Ancestors Occupation. Uh, my name is Josh Goodman. I am the staff historian at the State Archives of Florida here in Tallahassee. Uh, my contact information is up on the screen now. We'll also do it on the screen at the end of the presentation. So uh, if you don't have something to write with just at the moment, that's all right. We'll have this back up there. We love taking questions from folks about uh, the things that we talk about in this webinar or other questions that you might have about what we have at the State Archives. Uh, so please feel free to make use of that. Just a little bit of information about sort of where we are and what we do at the State Library and State Archives of Florida. That's right, we're a two-for-one institution. You get both the State Library with published information about the state of Florida, books and maps and publications from state agencies of all sorts. And then we also have the State Archives of Florida, uh, which focuses more on unpublished materials, things like government records and governor's correspondence and diaries and people's uh, personal correspondence and photographs and films and things like that. Lots of fun things. So we're located two blocks behind the Capitol at 500 South Bruno Street in Tallahassee. We are open just like a public library, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., except for state holidays. We also have uh, some special Saturday hours that we're open. And if you go to our website at info.florida.gov, that's info.florida.gov, and uh, click on the, the information for planning your visit. You'll be able to get to those Saturday hours and come and pay us a visit. Uh, you do not need an appointment. There's often a misconception about archives that you have to be an expert or you have to have special permission to view archival records here at the State Archives, and that's not true at all. Uh, our, our materials are owned by the people of the state of Florida, which we assume includes many of the folks in our audience today. Uh, so we hope that you'll take advantage of those and come in and use them whenever you like when we're open. We also have free parking in the parking garage adjacent to the RA Gray building uh, where we have the State Library and Archives. So uh, it's, it's nice and easy to just come right on in. We hope you will. So let's talk a little bit about our topic today, researching uh, your family member, your ancestor's occupation. Um, we've talked a lot in this series about some of the most burning questions about sort of how to put together a family tree. Uh, you know, some of the first things that you do oftentimes is, is to go through, you know, family Bibles and the census and talking with existing uh, living relatives about sort of who mom and dad and the kids are, uh, when people were born, when people died, when they got married, who they got married to, that sort of thing. Uh, and then oftentimes people will go into researching military service and that sort of thing. But what else can we do to sort of make a more complete picture of, of an ancestor's life? And I would say that studying what exactly that person did for a living, uh, what kinds of jobs that person might have held during their lifetime, maybe they were involved in public service of some sort, that is sort of a missing piece of the puzzle. Uh, that oftentimes we don't get in the standard family tree. And so I think that's uh, that's what we'll spend time talking about today, is what tricks can we use to figure out what occupation a person might have had in their lifetime. Uh, sometimes that's very well known in a family, but sometimes you're working with ancestors who you may not have access to any information about what they did for a living. And so we can uh, we can sort of help you uh, figure that out, and also to uh, if you do know what an ancestor's occupation was, in some cases we can help you find some records uh, that will give you more information about how that ancestor's career went and maybe use that career information to get to some other stuff. So we've, we've got some good things to talk about there. A few fair warnings before we get started. We're going to be looking at a number of sources that are that are kind of unusual. They go beyond the census and beyond the standard sets of sources that you might be using in genealogical research. Um, and for that reason, there are some shortcomings to those uh, record sources because, as you know, if you've done some research in genealogy, um, records are not always complete. Records can sometimes lack indexes. They can be hard to find. Um, you have to be ready to do some challenges to get to the really good stuff. Uh, so these are my, my standard set of warnings for these. Number one, not every source that we look at today is going to be exhaustive. Some of them are confined to very small periods of years, small periods of time. Uh, some of them, they might be missing 
parts of them. Like they're like if there's an index of something, you know, the index for A through L might have been preserved while the index for M through Z might have gone missing at some point. It's just not part of the thing. Um, it's also important to remember that some of these sources are the responsibility of the county to keep, and not every county keeps all their sources the same way. Uh, we're going to run into that example when we get to talking about how to research someone who was a doctor in the 19th and early 20th centuries because the uh, licensure records used to be kept at the county level with county boards of health and, and boards of uh, medical examiners that used to be active at the um, judicial district level uh, or circuit level. And, you know, some circuits kept those records and some didn't. Once the State Department of Health came online, they thought, all right, well, we don't need to hang on to this anymore because they're getting their licensures renewed uh, through the state. So it just depends on how the county or the, the judicial search, uh, circuit uh, kept their records. Not every person who should have been recorded in a source was recorded. We know this from looking at the census. Sometimes you know good and well that somebody was living in a certain area, but for whatever reason, they just don't show up on the census. Uh, the same thing is true for a lot of the records we'll look at today. Tax rolls, um, you know, certain licensure, uh, licensure uh, files and that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes folks just mysteriously don't show up for some reason, uh, so be prepared for that. Also, last but not least, some of the records we'll look at today will be computerized or they'll be in databases where you can at least look through indexes at the, uh, uh, on a computer. Uh, just remember that not every search engine is as, as forgiving as Google. Sometimes you're going to need to consider multiple spellings of names. Uh, not everybody was checking a name up against a social security card, you know, to make sure that the spelling matches. Sometimes social security cards don't even exist. Uh, for their ancestors that you're looking up. So, so keep that in mind. And the last thing I'd mention, I don't have it on the slide here, uh, but this is very true uh, of most of the, the sessions that we've done here. We're going to be talking about Florida-specific records here. Uh, however, a lot of the records that we talk about in the course of the presentation will be available for other states as well. So if you're joining us and you're, you've got relatives that you'd like to research who are in Kansas or Massachusetts or California, or something else. Um, some of this information will still be very useful to you. You're just going to have to, you know, sort of translate what do these record series look like in the state where your ancestor lived. So, uh, so just have that in mind. All right. So with all of these restrictions, you're thinking to yourself, "Gosh, this is an awfully, uh, you know, an, an awfully uh, difficult and tedious exercise. Why in the world still go through with it?" And uh, I'll tell you why. We got some examples here. For example, I've got my buddy Charles Winters from Escambia County, and I have his record here from the 1850 Federal Census. It shows his age there, and it shows that he was a hotel keeper over in Escambia County. He probably lived in downtown Pensacola there. All right, if I'm only looking at the census to get his occupation, I'm only going to see that he's a hotel keeper. However, if I look at some of the other sources that we're going to talk about today, I'm also going to find out that he owned a bar or a restaurant, uh, that he actually had a bowling alley, uh, kind of unusual for the 1850s, uh, and that he also owned billiards tables. Uh, that's something I wouldn't have gotten from the census, but by looking at tax rolls, which we're going to look at today, um, I'm able to determine that he had all of this other interesting information. So he had a pretty swell hotel. You know, it's not just some place to lay your head. It looks like they were also having a lot of fun at Charles Winters Hotel in, uh, in Escambia County. Another example here, I've got Thomas York, uh, who is in the 1870 federal census from Taylor County, and he shows up as a farmer. That is a census taker's favorite thing to write down for almost anybody in the census, uh, to call people a farmer. And uh, so you want to, anytime you see that, uh, if that person had served in any other capacity, if they had been in a public office, or if they had owned a grist mill, or or something like that, you wouldn't know it from looking at the census. Uh, the only way that you could uh, that you could get a little deeper into that is by uh, researching uh, either records of public service or records of, of postmasters and that sort of thing. And uh, if we look into those records, we find out that Thomas York actually was both a postmaster of a post office there in Taylor County and also a county commissioner. So there's a little bit more going on in his life than just being a farmer. And then my last example here, J.L. Morgan from Hamilton County. This is from the 1885 Florida State Census. Uh, it shows that he's into railroading, 
uh, which is great. But if we look in some other records as well, we can also find that he was actually a postmaster uh, of Marion, Florida, uh, that he owned a general store, and that he operated a grist mill and cotton gin. Uh, so there's a lot to learn about folks by going beyond just the census. So let's look into some ways of doing that. The first thing I want to look at is uh, direct sources. I call them direct sources because their entire purpose for existence is to tell you about individuals and what they do for a living uh, and where they're located and that sort of direct information. The most common of these is one you've probably encountered before at some point, and this is a good source to use if the ancestor you are researching lived in town, in a town big enough to have city directories made for it. Um, and that is city directories here. Um, these are great because they're kind of like the phone book, except they don't, you don't necessarily have to have had a phone uh, to, uh, to be in the city directory. This is everybody, phone or no phone. Um, and uh, I've got a little example over here on the right of what the listings look like for a person in the city directory. Uh, this is the way that the uh, R.L. Polk and Company publishers did them, and, and that was the main company that had the contract to do city directories for towns in Florida. They're not the only ones who did these, but Polk is, is by far the most prolific publisher of city directories in Florida. And you can see, for example, over here, let's, uh, let's look down here. So we've got Eugene Dearborn. This is, this is for the Miami city directory here. We've got Eugene Dearborn. He's, uh, he's not married, or at least it doesn't appear that he's married, because if he was, we'd see the name of his wife in here. See, like we've got Helen here for S. Griffin Davis. Uh, but down here with our buddy Eugene Dearborn, he doesn't have a wife listed. It shows that he was clerk of the circuit court and that his home was in the Coconut Grove subdivision uh, of Miami. Um, if we go down here a little bit farther, we see that we've got a locomotive engineer. We've got a guy who was a clerk working probably in a store or in an office somewhere. You'll notice that we've got some abbreviations in here that, that if you haven't worked with these before, you might not immediately know what the abbreviations mean. But if you look in the opening pages, the sort of the forward, the front matter of one of these city directories, they usually include a list of those abbreviations and what they mean. So, you know, if they don't spell it out like they did up here with our buddy Joseph Dan, who was a blacksmith in Miami, uh, then you know you can look at the abbreviations list to figure out what they're talking about. So I want to show you real quick, uh, if you have access to Ancestry.com, you can get your hands on these city directories pretty easily. Um, you can also get these in your public library or uh, especially the, the uh, university libraries and really big research libraries will oftentimes have, uh, they'll have these either the actual books or they'll have them on microfilm. We happen to have them uh, in, on microfilm and in print, and we have access to Ancestry here at the State Library and Archives of Florida. Uh, so that's a great, uh, all of those are great ways to get a hold of these. Uh, but I'm going to show you real quick how to get them on Ancestry in case you've got access to that. So I'm going to jump outside of the PowerPoint real quick and get into Ancestry.com right here. Now you'll see it says Ancestry Library. Uh, that's because we have a special library subscription to Ancestry. But if you just use Ancestry.com, uh, which is something they'll, you know, they'll, they'll sell to private individuals. The, the records are the same. It's just a few of the graphics are a little different here. So if I go down to the card catalog, and uh, it's going to give me, this is, this is showing me all the different groups of records that they have on Ancestry. If I type in city directories into my title up here and click search, all right, See if in, in here, in the results, it's going to show me all the different groups of records that are responsive to that search term, city directories. And just a few down the way here, I'm getting um, U.S. city directories, 1822 to 1995. And remember, not every record group is exhaustive. So this doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have your town all the way back to 1822. But you can qu pretty quickly find out what we do have by coming over here to this menu on the right and clicking on state choosing the state you're interested in. In our case, we're looking at Florida. If I was looking at Miami, uh, this city or county, sometimes it has it by the county, sometimes it's going to be by the city. You can choose whichever city you're interested in. I'm going to go with the Miami example since that's what we were just looking at. And it'll show you a list of all of the city directories that they have for that town. One last word of caution on this. Ancestry has the vast majority of your Polk city directories, but that does not mean that they have all of them. 
So again, check your different sources for this. Uh, look at Ancestry, but also consult your local research library or your local public library and find out which editions of the city directory they have. You may find that your local library has more than Ancestry does. Jumping back into our PowerPoint. Um, another older version of the city directory that can be handy, especially if you're working with ancestors who did not live within a municipality, is the Gazetteer. All right. A Gazetteer is essentially a guidebook. Usually they're published at the state level. Sometimes they'll be published for like the whole southeastern region or, or you know, sometimes you'll even get them for smaller regions within a state. Uh, but at the point of a gazetteer is to essentially be a guidebook for people who might be interested in traveling to one place or another, or maybe they're looking for the for addresses. Uh, advertisers would sometimes use these to get the names of store owners or business owners so that they could send advertising material uh, to people. Or, or maybe you were about to go on vacation to a particular place and you wanted to know what services were available. Anyway, whatever the purpose, gazetteers, uh, are fantastic because not only do they include business listings for large towns uh, in Florida like Jacksonville or Miami or Tallahassee or Tampa, but they will also include listings for very small towns. For example, if you look on the screen here, over here on the left hand side, I've scanned in a page from a gazetteer from 1883 and 1884, and you'll see over here that it's it's got some listings for Mount Dora, which in 1883 or 1884, Mount Dora was, was a pretty, pretty you know, a, a large town in comparison. You know, Orlando was pretty small at that time. The nearest town to, to Mount Dora at that time of any size would have been like Enterprise or something like that over in Volusia County. So Mount Dora is actually a pretty big town um, in the region. And you can see here that they've got lots of different uh, people listed uh, as, as being business owners in that area. You can see that we've got uh, general merchandise being sold, we've got hoteliers, we've got folks owning sawmills, we've got dressmakers, jewelers. Uh, so if you've got an ancestor who lived in town uh, and they had a business, you'll be able to find that uh, in a gazetteer. Now, again, these are not going to be entirely exhaustive, so if you don't find somebody in here and you were expecting to find one, you know, never fear. Maybe their business was closed for a little bit uh, during the time that your ancestor lived in a particular area. Maybe the gazetteer just wasn't able to find a listing for that. Um, you know, there can be a number of reasons why that happens. And then you can see over here we've got some smaller towns. Mosley Hall, for example, I mean, that's a wide spot in the road nowadays in Madison County. There's, there's not much going on there. And apparently there wasn't a ton going on there in the 1880s because you can see we've, we've got three, well, we've got four general stores. That's the population about 300. You know, they've got uh, that information in here. Sometimes you're just not going to have that much. Um, so gazetteers, good source. Where do you find those? Oftentimes you'll, uh, you're, you're either going to get those from your research library or another good source is archive.org. They've digitized a lot of these. Um, archive.org, it's a website. You don't have to, to pay to use that. You can just go right to archive.org and type in, you know, in search terms, you might type in Florida Gazetteer or, uh, well, that, that search term should get you gazetteers in the state of Florida. So that's, that's going to help you out. All right, so those are my direct sources that I have to share with you. Now let's look at licensure, registration, and certification. So, to do a number of different um, a number of different occupations, you either have to be licensed, like in the case of being a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. Uh, sometimes you have to be certified, doctors and lawyers, uh, something like that, uh, and 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 then sometimes registered as well. And these licenses and registrations can sometimes be recorded in very strange and unexpected ways. For example, um, if you've ever been licensed. To, to practice some particular profession, you know that when you get that license, you usually have to pay a fee of some sort. And that paying that fee, if there's, if there's one kind of record that the government is going to hang on to forever and ever, it's when you owe the government money or when the government owes you money. Uh, anytime money is being spent one way or another, uh, the government likes to keep a nice paper trail of that. And that's great for us genealogists because oftentimes that paper trail is kept for a very long time. Uh, the retention schedules on that sort of record, that's a schedule of how long we have to keep a certain kind of record, 
money oftentimes has the longest kind of retention schedule. So that's really helpful for us as genealogists as we go through. Also, those license records tend to be kept, some of the longest kept records, uh, since they're, you know, they're relating the fact that someone's licensed to do a particular kind of activity. So let's look through some examples of that. All right, first is one of my favorites, tax rolls. Um, taxes are collected every year, you know, at the county level, and then some of that money goes on to the state for state taxes. Um, and what's great about tax rolls in terms of, of, of figuring out an ancestor's occupation is that for a long time, county tax collectors actually were responsible for collecting licensure taxes uh, for uh, things like people who own general stores, or people who loaned money, and notice how I say people who loaned money instead of banks. You didn't actually have to be a bank to loan money in those days. Uh, and you would, any private individual who had promissory notes uh, that they were hanging on to because they had loaned money, they actually got taxed on that. Uh, if you had billiards tables, or uh, if you had a bar or something like that, sin taxes were collected uh, through county tax collectors. And so you can actually determine uh, if you had an ancestor who owned uh, a hotel or a general store, or if they had a sawmill or something like that, you can use tax rolls uh, for the time period when those things were being collected on by the county tax collector. You can use the tax roll to figure out uh, when your ancestor may have had one of those buildings. So what we're looking at here is we have, uh, this is a, a page from a tax roll, um, and this is showing on the left-hand side here we've got uh, the names of all the heads of household in the county, and then you've got all these columns showing all the different things that somebody could be taxed on. Now, the most common ones that are taxed on from the very beginning of the territory of Florida all the way up into the 20th century is going to be land. And if you own land now, you know that that's what the majority of your, of your relationship with the county tax collector is going to be, is with land. Same thing is true in the mid-19th century where this example comes from. You've got several different columns here that deal with how much, uh, how much land in several different categories of land that people are being taxed on. City lots and first-rate land and second-rate land, that sort of thing. But then as we get along farther down the line, I'm going to uh, blow this up in just a minute so we can actually see what these columns say. But as we go a little bit farther down the line, you'll see that people are being taxed on whether they have a store or whether they're a doctor or a lawyer or if they have a sawmill or something like that. And the way that you can determine whether your ancestor uh, was paying taxes for being in one of these professions is if you see that they're actually being charged money, like I can show you right here, this guy, can't see his name, the, the page is a little bit small, but you can see how every now and then you'll actually see an amount instead of just these little dots here. You'll actually see an amount in there. That means that this guy is actually being charged money, uh, charged, charged taxes uh, for being involved in whatever activity that is in that column. So let's look at what some of those columns are uh, for the mid-19th mid century. So some things that people were getting taxed on, loaning money at interest. Uh, that was a tax on usury, essentially. Uh, which in, in those days, it, usury was the term used for, for charging interest on any money loaned. Uh, so if you had an ancestor who was loaning money, they could, you, they could show up in a tax roll for that. Um, banks, they're in here. So if you've got a banker ancestor, that's going to show up. Merchant stock and trade. So if you've got an ancestor with a general store. Um, if you've got somebody who is um, a cotton factor or something like that, that's going to show up. Um, people who own cattle. Uh, retailers of Spiritus and Venus liquors. Uh, so if you've got an ancestor who's maybe selling some whiskey or maybe some wine and spirits and that sort of thing, that's going to show up. Uh, taverns, innkeepers, bars, tin pen alleys, those bowling alleys, billiard tables, doctors and lawyers. Um, you know, the licensure tax has got to be collected by somebody, so that's going to be available through here. You can also get some cool information, like whether you had an ancestor who had a gold and silver watch. That's kind of cool. Um, and then down here, we've got people who own sawmills. So there's just all kinds of things that you can get from tax rolls. So where do you get these? Where do you get these records? Well, FamilySearch, uh, which is an, uh, an extension program of the LDS Church based out of Utah, FamilySearch, uh, they have digitized rolls of microfilm of these tax rolls from the state of Florida. Uh, they're not fully transcribed, and they don't like to put records up until they've been transcribed. 
So they're not going to be up for a little while yet. I'm told 2020 is going to be when they go up. But until then, you can get these from the state archives. Um, you can come in to research them on your own, on microfilm if you like, or if you have a specific ancestor that you are looking for, you can actually ask the reference desk uh, to take a look at those uh, roles and, and pick out the page that has your particular ancestor on it and make a copy for you. Okay, and, uh, and you can also contact me. I can, uh, my, my contact information will be at the end of this, and I can also forward that on to the reference desk as well. I'm going to show you real quick a way to look in the Archives Online catalog to determine which tax rolls we have for your county. So I'm going to skip over here to uh, my web browser, and I've already got the State Archives online catalog pulled up here. It's archivescatalog.info.florida.gov. Anybody can get to this, even if you're in Timbuktu, you can get a hold of this pretty easy. Okay, now you'll notice in the PowerPoint it mentioned that I was in Series S28. Uh, that's all of, our, all of our series of records here at the State Archives have those series numbers or collection numbers. And so I'm going to show you a little shortcut to get right to that. I could either search for tax rolls if I wanted to, and I could get to it that way, but I'm going to actually put in, in quotation marks, S space 28, close quotation marks. And that's a nice little shortcut to get, oop, error, trying that again. There it goes. All right, that's getting me right to the series that I want. Series S28, Florida Comptroller's Office, tax rolls for 1829 to 1898. Now you see that we don't have any going past 1898, not to worry because those tax rolls after 1898 tend to be kept by your county tax collector, tax assessor, or clerk of court. Now, once you get to that point in time, they tend to only have taxes that were collected for land. But that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be tax, uh, that there wouldn't be tax records for licensure uh, in the records of the county, county uh, clerk. So once you get past the period that we have here at the State Archives, you can certainly check at the county level and you're going to be able to find some licensure tax records sometimes with your county clerk. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this search result for Series S28. And this is going to tell me a little bit about this series of records, but if I go over here to the small folder icon, it's going to put out a tree here showing me exactly which tax rolls the State Archives has organized by county. So for example, if I was doing uh, research on Columbia County and I'm looking and I know that I've got an ancestor who lived in Columbia County in the 1850s, this is showing you exactly which tax rolls you can expect the State Archives to have. And so you can say to the State Archives uh, reference desk, hey, I've got an ancestor named John Smith who lives in Columbia County in the 1850s. I would like to get copies of any pages in Series S28, the tax rolls, um, that, that, that have his name on it. Um, and that's something that they can look through fairly quickly. They tend to be organized in alphabetical order, so it doesn't take that long to go through the tax rolls for those years. Um, do keep in mind that the reference desk can only spend about 30 minutes per request uh, for this. So, you know, you may not want to give them a huge range of years. Try to narrow that down a little bit. Uh, so that they can, you can make sure that they've got time to get to all of that in the 30 minutes that they can allot to you. And then, of course, you always have the option of, of coming in to do that research on your own as well. All right, let's jump back over to our PowerPoint. So that's tax rolls. County commission minutes. Sometimes licensure taxes are mentioned in county commission meeting minutes. Uh, so, for example, I have here pulled up some uh, county commission meeting minutes from Taylor County in 1877, and we've got some notes in here from the tax collector, Mr. Calhoun, and you'll see in here that he's actually got some of his financial records in here, and he's showing uh, several different licensure taxes. So, for example, we've got this guy, S.A. Wilcox, who's actually Samuel A. Wilcox. He was a doctor in, uh, in Taylor County, and we can see that he is paying his licensure taxes to practice both law and medicine. Ooh, that's a busy guy. Uh, and then down here, we've got our buddy T.J. Edwards, who is uh, paying his license tax to sell liquor and merchandise. So it looks like he had a general store that happened to also sell a little bit of whiskey. So there you go. So county commission meeting minutes, that is another option. Now, 
Um, counties sometimes would have, uh, the revenue collector would sometimes have completely separate books for those. So it may not always be in the minutes of the commission. Sometimes the tax collector is going to have his own records. Sometimes they're together. Again, every county keeps their records differently. So you've just got to, once you kind of know that this kind of record is, it, it does exist, contact your county uh, clerk of courts and say, hey, I'm looking for records, you know, from the tax collector county tax collector for the 1870s or 1880s, do you happen to know where those would be? Sometimes their answer is going to be no, uh, that those records just don't exist. If you get that question, turn around and ask, well, okay, do you have county commission meeting minutes? Because sometimes those tax collection records can be hiding in books of county commission meeting minutes, as we see in this example. Okay, articles of incorporation, another great record. Okay, so if you have an ancestor who was a partner in a business of some sort, oftentimes businesses would incorporate so that they could share the liabilities that would come to that business amongst several groups of people. And so that that business uh, could sue and be sued and own property as a business instead of everybody having to do things by, by uh, individual. That's a smart thing to do if you're working with several different business partners because you don't want any single member of the business to become financially or legally liable for what the corporation does. That's why businesses incorporate. So that's good for us as genealogists because that process of becoming a corporation has a paper trail. In the early days, a business would get chartered uh, by going to the legislature and getting a legislative charter. But once you get to roughly the 1870s, uh, the Florida Department of State uh, starts issuing letters patent for corporations. You apply to the Secretary of State to get letters, letters patent, and uh, then you get those from the, uh, from the Secretary of State, and a copy of those letters patent were kept here at the Department of State, which we now have in the State Archives. Those uh, articles of incorporation usually list the name and location of the corporation, what exactly the company was going to be doing, how much capital stock was going to go into the company, um, and most importantly for genealogists, who the incorporators and principal stockholders were at the time of incorporation. Okay, those records are available here at the State Archives from roughly 1874 to 1953. You can get into some later records through sunbiz.org, which is the website of the Florida Division of Corporations, which is part of the Florida Department of State. Um, so the, unlike the uh, tax rolls, we don't really have a good index online uh, for those records from 1874 to 1953, but there is one way. If you happen to know the name of the company that your ancestor was associated with, there is a way for you to look and determine what year uh, that, that uh, corporation was established. So I'm going to show you that real quick. I'm going to jump over to the Internet real quick. The uh, reports of the Secretary of State, okay, if you go to the uh, State Library's website at library.florida.gov, okay, and if you type in report Secretary of State or something like that, because what we're looking for is the annual report of Florida Secretary of State. All right, we've got biennial report of Secretary of State, but I want to go down a little farther. Look here. Report of the Secretary of State of the State of Florida. And see how it says electronic access right here? The vast majority of these reports have been digitized. And so we can get to them online to look through those reports of the Secretary. What, because what's great is every year they would include in those reports a list of all the corporations that had been approved that year. Okay, so you can click on any one of these and it'll take you to that biennial report for that group. Now you can see that there's a few missing in here. Uh, but all the other ones you should be able to get to in here. And Google Books has also digitized some of these. So if you're looking for some of those that are kind of in the hole right here, uh, you may be able to get those from Google Books or archive.org. Now these take a while to load, so I've already got one loaded up right here so that I can show you what those listings look like. Now it won't list the incorporators in these. That's why I said this is, this is really only going to be helpful if you know the name of the company or you have an inkling of what that company might have been named uh, in, in uh, uh, and, and you know that your ancestor was part of that company. This is going to give you information about that company's founding, so you can at least figure out when the corporation was founded. Now, this is only going to include the corporations that were established or changed in that year, so you may have to look through multiple editions of the Secretary of State's report to get to what you want, uh, but this is a very handy thing. 
Otherwise, if you know, if you if you have an inkling of what kind of corporation your ancestor might be in, but you're not exactly sure, um, contact the State Archives Reference Desk and say, hey, is there a is there a company in you know that's that's headquartered in Arcadia, Florida, named something like the Arcadia Fruit Company or Arcadia Cattle Company or something like that? That's that's um, you know that's incorporated maybe in the 19 teens or something like that. And that's something that they can look through the index for. Um, again, there's not an index for individual incorporators, uh, so they're not necessarily going to be able to look your ancestor up by name, but at least they can get you a little closer uh, to some things. So let's jump back into the PowerPoint. All right. And uh, just, oh, and sunbiz.org, that's just give sunbiz.org a try, and it'll have a button on there that says search records. And it's, it's, they've got some pretty good instructions on there on how to get to that. That's going to let you research more recent corporations. Uh, so that's there. So just a little, little quick example of the cool stuff that you can get from these, because um, private organizations like clubs and charities and things like that, they get incorporated too, right? They're nonprofits. Um, they, they have articles of incorporation as well. And so Sometimes when you when you look through those articles of incorporation for a community where your ancestor lived, you can find really cool connections between people that you would never have imagined could have existed. So for example, look at these guys that we have from Jacksonville in 1868. Now I looked in the census and determined what all of these guys were doing uh, in 1870 or 1880. We got a carpenter, an engineer, we got a baker here, a brick mason, steamboat captain, hotel keeper, grocer. They all seem to be kind of different guys. They're not named the same except for these two who appear to be brothers. Um, and they're all doing different things. What in the world could they possibly have in common? It turns out they actually were incorporated as a volunteer fire company. And we found this out by looking at articles of incorporation from Jacksonville at the time that they were all living in town. So lots of cool stuff to find by looking through articles of incorporation. Militia muster rolls. Now you might be might be thinking this is kind of an odd way to get at uh, uh, to get at this, but in reality, um, you know, militia muster rolls. Remember that militia militia units are in existence even when wars are not around. Militia units are out there sort of as a just in case in case there's some kind of trouble, and it doesn't even have to be a war. Uh, militia units, or, or what we would now call the National Guard, they get called out for all kinds of things. Disasters, civil disturbances, riots, moving prisoners from place to place. Militia units get used for all kinds of things. And for that reason, the leadership of a militia unit, oftentimes they wanted to know what kinds of skills the members had. And for that reason, a lot of your older militia muster rolls are going to actually list the occupations of the members. So, for example, I've got an example of one. This is this is a militia, a naval militia unit from Tampa from 1897, and it's actually listing all of the different um, uh, all of the different occupations of the individuals. So you can see in this unit we've got a photographer. If you've ever seen Burgert Brothers Photography uh, from Tampa, this is actually one of the Burgert Brothers who was a photographer, but he was also 19 years old and already in photography. Look at that. Uh, he was also a member of this naval militia unit. Of course, it's 1897, so we can imagine why. Uh, the the, the uh, Spanish-American War is sort of on the horizon. People are wondering if the United States is going to go to war with Spain, and we do see an uptick in, uh, in muster units, for, uh, militia units forming at this time. But you can see all the different things that people are doing here. So how do you get to militia muster rolls? The good news is Florida Memory is just about to, we've, we've finished all of the scanning. We're still doing some of the indexing and some of the prep work that goes into putting these online. Uh, we're about to have a pretty complete run of the militia muster rolls for the 19th century. That should be going up and they'll be keyword searchable and name searchable. So you'll just be able to look for a family name. Uh, but these records exist for the 20th century as well. For a variety of reasons, we're not doing the 20th century records right now. Uh, but if you know you had an ancestor who was in uh, the military or was in a, the National Guard, the Florida National Guard at some point uh, in the 20th century, those records may exist. Uh, contact the uh, State Archives Reference Desk and say, hey, I've got an ancestor named so-and-so, and I think he might have been in the National Guard in such and such a year. Could you check that out? And if there is a record of his uh, enrollment in a militia unit, can I get a copy of that? 
um, and that's something that they can do. Give as specific an information as you can, the years that he would have joined, uh, if you can guess that or, or know that, um, and, and where he would have been living, and that's going to make it easier for the reference desk to do their job. Sources for specific occupations. All right. Now, lawyers. Um, lawyers, for many years, on into the 20th century, the way you became a lawyer, uh, you didn't necessarily have to have a law degree. Is that scary or what? Uh, but you could actually become a lawyer by doing what was called reading the law. In other words, you would, you might work with somebody who was already a lawyer, or you might not. But one way or another, you would read all of the different laws that existed in your state. You would read case law. You would read essentially all the things that law school students read now, but you would be responsible for sort of just sort of memorizing and interpreting what you were reading on your own. And then when you were ready to actually practice law, you would go before a judge in the jurisdiction where you wanted to uh, practice law, and the judge would appoint a committee of examiners, of existing lawyers who were already at the bar, so to speak, in that jurisdiction, and they would examine you, and then they would report back to the judge and say, yeah, this guy can practice law. He knows enough of his stuff that he's going to be able to practice law effectively in this jurisdiction, or they'd say, nah, need to wait a little bit. And so the way that you find records of this is that uh, you go to the minutes of that jurisdiction and look in that jurisdiction, and it'll have uh, records where they're saying, okay, we're, we're appointing a committee to examine so-and-so to see if he's ready to go to the bar, uh, and then when that decision is made that he is ready, um, then you know, you'll see a record of that as well. This, for example, this comes from the records, uh, the minutes of the circuit court uh, in Taylor County uh, in the 1890s, and here we've got a guy, a guy named uh, Harry Stewart uh, who was applying for admission to the bar, the judge appointed these guys, M.L. Smith, C.J. Hardy, and G.W. Beer, or Breyer, something like that, Bean maybe, um, uh, to examine the guy, and they said that he was good to go, so they sworn him, uh, they sworn him in, uh, swore him in, and uh, he was ready to practice law in that jurisdiction, in the Third Circuit. All right, doctors. So used to, when the territory first started out, starting in the 1820s, um, towns would have local boards of health that would certify physicians as being eligible to practice medicine in that town. And if you wanted to practice medicine somewhere else, then that board of health would have to pass off on your credentials and, and examine you to determine if you could do that or not. Later on down the line, uh, the state established examining boards. There was an examining board uh, starting in the 1880s. You had an examining board in every uh, judicial circuit. So the first, second, third, on, on and on, each judicial circuit would have its own examining board. And then even later down the line, uh, they made it to where there was a state board of medical examiners uh, who would examine candidates uh, for practicing medicine in uh, the state of Florida. So how do you get your hands on the records for these? If you're looking for an ancestor who was practicing medicine at the time that local boards of health were doing it, and these local boards of health tend to only exist for the larger cities. Out in the rural areas, you got people who are, once they pay their license tax, they're good to go. Um, and they may not even have a, a state or a local license to practice medicine. But if they're in a town, chances are they're, they're, they're going to be uh, uh, licensed by that local board of health. Um, when you get to the later ones, uh, and, and those local boards of health, sometimes those records still exist, sometimes they do not. Um, sometimes you have to come at it tangentially and sort of look at other things, like if you've got, um, like if you've got, if the town that you're looking in uh, has kept its death records from before death records were kept by the uh, um, the uh, uh, the state department of health. Sometimes you can get at it that way. Um, when, once the state has a board of medical examiners, we do have some records for that here at the state archives. Um, but we only have that for kind of a short window of time in the 1880s, uh, 1890s, and the early 1900s. Um, and that's, that's a state examining board here that we would have those records for. Um, I have found that the first judicial circuit based in Pensacola has uh, a, a pretty complete set of records of their uh, medical uh, uh, licensing doctors from the 1880s and 1890s 
and we have photocopies of that here at the State Archives, and those records may still exist over in Escambia County. Uh, to see if, I do not know if they have them in the headquarters of other judicial circuits, but the way that you would determine if they do is, uh, is find the sort of the headquarters of that judicial circuit where your ancestor is located and contact that local clerk of courts uh, or, or contact the folks in charge of that judicial circuit and ask if they have records of the medical examining board for that judicial circuit. Uh, and they should be able to tell you if they do or do not. So dentists and dental hygienists, we have application records for those here at the uh, State Archives, and they're in several different record series to get an idea of what years we have them for, because each, you know, there's, there's several different ones. We've got a series for people who had been licensed before and were trying to get relicensed. We've got some for people who attempted to get licensed and they failed their examination, so they couldn't get licensed, but they kept the application forms. All of this can be very useful if you're trying to track down the details on an ancestor who was a dental or a dental hygienist or a dentist. Uh, but this is one of those where you just have to look in uh, the State Archives online catalog to see what we have. Now, they are not, uh, they're not indexed by name, but if you have a particular ancestor that you think was a dentist and you have a sense of generally when that person might have been uh, a dentist or dental hygienist, when they might have been getting certified, uh, then, you can, then you can contact the State Archives Reference Desk and say, hey, I've got this ancestor, here's his name, here's where he lived, here's approximately about the time that he would have, you know, maybe been trying to get certified uh, to, to practice dentistry, and they should be able to go from there. All right, um, architects, this one's pretty easy because we only have one volume of, uh, of, of records of, of people getting certified to practice as an architect. It goes from 1915 to 1970, um, and so that one's pretty easy. Just contact the State Archives. Uh, if you know that you have an ancestor who was an architect and you're interested in looking at that, then uh, you, can, you can contact the State Archives Reference Desk and say, hey, I've got an ancestor named so-and-so. He was an architect. I'm not Maybe you're not sure what uh, city he was practicing in, but uh, you can uh, find out whether we have a record of that and whether he was certified and what his certification number was and that sort of thing, when he was certified, when it might have been renewed, uh, by asking the Archives Reference Desk to take a look at Series S1195 uh, to look for his name or her name. Teachers, same thing here. Uh, these records are also um, kind of, you know, it, it just depends on the time period. Uh, that you're looking at. The, the most records that we have on teacher certification come from the late 19th century. Uh, there are some other record series that you can use to kind of triangulate when somebody might have become certified as a teacher. These are great because not only do you get the fact that they're certified, but you also get their post office address, so you know kind of where they were living at the time. This is series S243. Uh, if you're interested in determining if you had an ancestor who was certified as a teacher at some point, again, this is one where you can call into the State Archives Reference Desk or contact me, and we can, uh, we can take a look. The 1880s and 1890s are going to be where we have the bulk of those. And you can also look on the State Archives online catalog to see the exact dates. Um, last category here, we've got Researching an Ancestor's Public Service. Um, the best place to start for this is the state and county officer directories. Okay, um, the Secretary of State, ever since uh, ever since he was the Secretary of the Territory, going all the way back to the 1820s, has been responsible for uh, countersigning the commissions that the governor issues to each elected and appointed official. And the Secretary of State or Territory also has kept an index of all of those commissioned officers, county and state level, going all the way back to the 1820s. And we have those here at the State Archives. So what that means is that if you've got an ancestor who was a constable, a sheriff, uh, a justice of the peace, a school board member, a county commissioner, a tax collector, an inspector of marks and brands, if he had to have, or she had to get a commission from the governor, it's going to be in that index. And we have those records going from the 1820s up to 1989, ready to go. And so uh, what you do in that case is if you've got an ancestor, you have a general idea of when he might have been in public service, you can contact us at the State Archives and say, hey, I've, I'm interested to get some information on when my ancestor might have been commissioned. 
Give us the name. Give us the county that he or she lived in. Uh, give us the approximate years that you think that the person held this office, and we should be able to come up with that listing for you. Okay. Um, if you also, if you want to know just who the county officers were generally in a county at a given time, we can give you that information as well. Um, these, these records are kept in volumes that are organized by year and by county, and so it's not that hard for us to get, us, get you those pages. Um, also, we're in the process of digitizing these so that you'll be able to search them on Florida Memory. Uh, so that's something that, we can, that, that you can look forward to in the future. Now, once you know that you have an ancestor who served in a particular public capacity, oftentimes we can get you their commission uh, because we have copies of those commissions uh, here at the State Archives. Series S1285 has a lot of those. This is something that you can go online to the State Archives online catalog and see what years we have those. Now, 1285 is not the only series that have these. There's a number of others depending on what job your ancestor held. Best thing to do is to contact the State Archives reference desk and say, hey, I'd like to get, I know that my ancestor was the sheriff of Marion County in the 19 teens. I'd like to get a copy of his, uh, I'd like to get a copy of his, uh, of his commission. And that's going to be the best way to do it because we can look it up pretty quickly from there. This is what a commission looks like right here on the left hand side of your screen. Uh, also, commissioned officers had to turn in a written oath uh, swearing that they would uphold the state and, and United States constitutions, uh, so we can generally get those as well. Also, if you had an ancestor who was a tax collector uh, or a tax assessor or a sheriff or somebody who had to be bonded, Oftentimes, we'll have a copy of the bond as well. Uh, for example, we've got one here from a guy who was named J.W. Applegate, and it looks like he was going to be, let's see, what was his job going to be? Anyway, it was one that had to be, uh, one that, that where he had to be bonded, okay? And what's great about this is not only do you get this information about your ancestor, but you also get to see who the guys were who actually put up the money for his bond. So you get to see some family and friendly relationships there. The census is not going to give you who somebody's friends were, uh, but this is a kind of document that can help you reconstruct that. So that's pretty good. Again, county commission minutes. Some things, some jobs, some forms of public service, uh, if you were employed by the county commission to do some tasks, um, you're, you don't need a commission from the governor for that, so you're not going to be able to use those documents we just talked about for that. However, if you look in the minutes of the county commission, when they appoint somebody to do a job like marking a road or repairing the courthouse or serving as the county attorney or serving in a variety of capacities, you're going to see that in the minutes of the county commission. So, for example, here I've got, um, I'm using my Taylor County uh, county commission minutes here. I'm, I'm seeing that John M. Tolles uh, was appointed as uh, a road commissioner, so that's somebody who is in charge of making sure that the road is clear of obstructions and, you know, filling in any potholes and that sort of thing. Um, and let's see, we've also got another commissioner being gotten down here. So that's the kind of job that you can expect to find records of in county commission meeting minutes. And just one reminder, we are digitizing those state and county officer um, records. If this is something that you'd be interested in volunteering to help out with, um, volunteers only take on just a few pages at a time. It's all done through Google Sheets and Google Drive, so you don't have to have any special software. You don't even have to have a Google account, actually, because uh, it can all be done through just uh, links and things. If this is something that you'd be interested in helping out with for your county, uh, it's great because it, it benefits the state archives. It's going to help us get this into a searchable database on Florida memory even faster. It also helps your county because you get to keep copies of whatever you do to help us build the database. Uh, so, for example, we had somebody who worked with the Osceola County Historical Society. She single-handedly transcribed the entire county, all of the officers from its entire existence, from the 19 teens up through the up through 1989, and now the Historical Society has a complete set of all the officer commissions for Osceola County, the same as we do here at the State Archives. So the work doesn't just benefit us, it also benefits you and any organizations you happen to be working with who could use this information. So if you're interested in that, please do get in touch with me. Whew! All right, that was a lot of information. Do we have any questions? 
And this is Melissa just jumping in here. If you guys have questions, you can raise your hand or type it into chat. So it looks like we've got somebody with their hand up. Nope, and the hand has gone down. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Type them into chat or raise your hand. Um, we're going to give you a couple, a couple minutes. Uh, we have one question. What about religious leaders and funeral businesses? Religious leaders. Now, the census will tell you if somebody was, well, it'll tell you sometimes if somebody was a minister of some sort. They have a bad habit. Census takers have a terrible habit of, of writing. If they had a farm, they put them down as a farmer, even if they were doing five other things and wearing five other hats. But we do see ministers uh, being... Um, uh, being listed, uh, you know, in uh, in the census as ministers. Another way that you can cross-reference that is if you if you think you have an ancestor who was a minister in a particular community in a particular time, look at marriage records from that time period. If you can go to the county clerk's office for that county and look at copies of the marriage uh, marriage licenses, the licenses, not the marriage certificate, but the marriage licenses, and uh, well, excuse me, I got that backwards, the certificates. Uh, because the minister will sign off on those on those uh, marriage certificates a lot of times, uh, so that can be helpful. I'm trying to think. Um, let's see. And then what was the other question? The other one. It was not just ministers. It funeral was businesses. Funeral directors. Okay. So I know that we have that's one city directories for sure, um, and that's that's a good one because because uh, gazetteers and city directories are definitely going to be the best in there. I don't know that funeral directors and undertakers had to be licensed um, in the 19th century. I don't think that they had that they were being taxed in any special way where they would show up in a tax role, but they probably would show up in a gazetteer. Certainly would show up in a city directory if there's one available for the town and place where you're looking. I'm trying to think. There is a board that certifies funeral directors and embalmers in the state of Florida. It starts in the 20th century. Um, I can check to see if we have any records from that here at the State Archives. If you would, pop me an email, and that'll give me a chance to uh, uh, that'll give me a chance to look that up and see for sure. There's a chance. I know that we know who the members of that board were, but I don't know if we have records of who they certified. And we've got, what about um, the religious leaders? Was there any sort of licensure required for them? Not that I know of. Typically, the, the sort of the kind of the bar to pass for that is going to be with the actual organization that sort of calls them. So like, for example, with, uh, I mean, with, like, for example, with, with Catholic priests, it's going to be the local diocese is going to have, you know, some records, uh, you know, saying, okay, this person's, now going to be assigned to this parish or something like that. Um, with other denominations, there may be what's called a conference. Like, for example, Baptist churches, Methodist churches, a number of other denominations, they'll have conferences. And they'll, they'll have their own examination requirements, and so you get them that way. Uh, but, but I don't know if there being any licensure requirements, whatever, for, uh, for a religious leader uh, from the state's perspective. Does anybody have any other questions? Those are great questions, by the way. And if any come up to you, as I know we went through this very quickly, if you look through this on the YouTube channel and there's something that wasn't quite clear or if you have sort of a, a, a specific question about a specific occupation and you'd like to get in touch with me, please feel free to do that. We love getting, we love solving mysteries uh, here at the State Archives. So we're certainly glad to have, uh, to hear all about the mystery that you've encountered or the dead end that you've encountered. We love doing that. We're just going to stay on for a couple more minutes and make sure that we get all of your questions answered. But for those of you that have to go and do other stuff, thank you for being on with us. We have another comment. In general, I have had luck finding religious ministers' appointments in county slash clerk minutes collections.
And thanks again to Josh for doing this wonderful series for us. You can find it all on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's a genealogy playlist where you can watch all of the videos um, and share them to all of your genealogy friends. <laughs> we'll be sending out a follow-up email after the session with links to the recording. So we're going to give you guys a couple more minutes to ask your questions. So if you've got any questions, ask them now. Or you can contact Josh if you think of something later. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely, and I know we were, we blew through some of these very, very quickly, uh, but I can certainly explain any of these in greater detail. Uh, if you have one that you're particularly interested in, uh, certainly uh, uh, very glad to do that. Okay, well, it looks like we've got apparently all the questions answered for now, so we're going to go ahead and um, shut things down for today. But thank you guys for being on with us, and hopefully we'll see you online again for the next one.